Okay, let's look at the next bunch of examples. Again, take a moment, pause the video, have a work through these examples. If you come to one that you're struggling with, you don't know how to start, you get stuck part way through it, then navigate to that portion of the video and, and uh, we'll work through it. So I'm going to start with A, the antiderivative of x squared ln of x squared dx. What can we do here? What can we do? Well, maybe we can work on it by parts. I don't know if this will work, but let's see what happens. By parts, what should I choose? I choose something for u and something for dv. What, I'm gonna, what am I going to pick for u? Well, it's going to be something that I can differentiate. And we have problems anti-differentiating the logarithm in that it, they're pretty involved, usually, finding antiderivatives of logarithms. So that might be a good one to put here for u. And I'll leave the rest for dv. So the derivative is 2 ln of x all over x dx. And the antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x cubed. Have I made any progress? Well, I'm going to have to compute the integral. Well, I, I shouldn't say I'm going to have to. I'm going to reduce this to a problem where I have to look at the integral of v du. If I look at the product of v and du, it's going to be an x squared times a log. I started with an x squared times a log squared. Now I'm reducing it to an x squared times a log. Seems I've made progress. I've reduced the power on the logarithm. So it might, we might be in good shape here. Let's have a look minus the product of these two, so that's 2 thirds integral of the log of x, x cubed divided by x, so that's the x squared dx. Now at this stage, I might, it might be worthwhile to try by parts again because I've reduced the power on the logarithm by 1. So maybe we can do that again here and get rid of it altogether. So I'll take u to be ln of x, dv to be x squared dx. And so then du is equal to 1 over x dx, and v is equal to 1 third x cubed. So this is 1 third x cubed ln of x all squared minus 2 thirds times the application of by parts to this integral, which is 1 third x cubed ln of x minus 1 third the integral, and we're looking at the product of v du here, um, x cubed divided by x, so that's x squared dx. And I've reduced it now to just the integral of an x squared, which is something we can do. So that's ln of x all squared minus 2 ninths x cubed ln of x plus 2 ninths. And then we've got an extra 1 third x cubed. So I will join that 3 on the bottom with the 9 that's on the bottom to get a 2 over 27 x cubed plus c. And so there's our result. Okay, so let's look at the next example. It's uh, cos cubed x sine 2x. So we're looking at the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of cos cubed x sine 2x dx. So what can we do here? Well, one thing to notice is that the arguments in the cosine and the sine don't match up. And this sine 2x, we have an identity. We have a trig identity that tells us that sine 2x is 2 sine x cos x. That might be, nice, might be nice to use because then I get four cosines instead of only three of them and a sine. And that was sine 2x is twice this, so there's actually a 2 that pops out as well. 
Now why is this nice? Well, it means that I can substitute for cosine because the derivative right there is sine. So now I can use a substitution. So I started with a trig identity to rewrite it. Now I use the substitution. u equals cosine of x. du is equal to negative sine x dx. It's a definite integral, so we'll switch the limits of integration as well. When x is pi by 2 and when x is 0, u is equal to what in these cases? Pi by 2, cos of pi by 2 is 0. Cos of 0 is 1. So our new lower limit is 1, our new upper limit is 0. And we get 2. Lower limit's 1, upper limit's 0. Cos gets replaced with u, so that's u to the fourth. The sine dx gets replaced with a negative du. So there's a du and then a negative sign that comes out. And so this becomes, well, I can switch the limits of integration by uh, adding an extra negative sign, or in other words, I can absorb that negative sign into the integral by switching the limits of integration. So I get 0 to 1, u to the fourth, du, and that's going to be twice the integral of u to the fourth, so that's 1 fifth u to the fifth from 0 to 1, and so our answer is 2 fifths. So there's our result. How about the next example? Okay, so that, actually, let's just look at it up here. So part C, what can we do here? Well, if I just go ahead and simplify the integrand. Before I try anything else, just see if we can simplify the integrand. So x to the negative one half multiplied into both of those terms. That becomes an x. x to the minus one half times x to the plus one half. That becomes a one. So it's three over x minus one dx. That's what it simplifies to. Just rewriting the integrand, and that's going to be three ln of x minus one plus c. And so we're done. So this one here is just to illustrate that, you know, when you're looking at the integrand, go ahead, work on trying to simplify it first, and sometimes if you simplify it down, you can see straight away how to find the antiderivative of it. Other times, once you do a little bit of simplification, rewriting using trig identities, then you might have to use other methods. But for this one, it was just straightforward simplification, and see that the antiderivative is a logarithm. How about the next one? The integral of square root of x squared minus 1 over x. And there's a hint there. It says Use substitution, in, in fact, use substitution x equals secant theta. So this is d, the integral of square root of x squared minus 1 all over x dx. And the hint was make this substitution x equals secant of theta. Okay, so if we make that substitution, then dx becomes the root of secant, that's secant theta tan theta d theta. And if you remember these trig substitutions, where you substitute uh, one of the variables in place of a trig function, then what we would like is to know the relationship between the angle theta and the variable x, so that we can write everything later on back in terms of x. So I'll draw a little diagram here. What's secant of theta? Secant of theta is uh, hypotenuse over the adjacent side because the cosine of theta was the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So secant of theta is supposed to be x. So this is going to be uh, x here and this is going to be 1. And if that's 1 and that's x and this is a right triangle then the Pythagorean theorem tells us that these, this side here has to be x squared minus 1. And generally, when you construct this triangle and find the missing side, you know you've d probably done everything correct if the root of the thing that you're, you've got for the missing side is exactly the square root that appears in the integrand. So that's the goal with making the substitution, is the square root that's appearing in the integrand should be the, exactly one of those sides in your, right, in your right triangle. So we make this substitution. What does that mean? Well, it means that but the reason we choose the substitution of secant is because I get a secant squared minus 1. So let's just remember this set. The square root of x squared minus 1, the reason we're making the substitution is because this would become the square root of secant squared theta minus 1. Secant squared theta minus 1, 
that's tan squared. And the square root of tan squared is going to be tan of theta. So this becomes tan theta. What is x? x is secant theta. dx, dx is secant theta tan theta d theta. So we've taken our original integrand in terms of x and rewritten in terms of this new variable u using this trigonometric substitution. Now we can simplify these expressions a little bit, simplify the integrand a little bit. That becomes a tan squared theta d theta. Do I know the antiderivative of tan squared? Not off the top of my head, but I do know that tan squared is related to secant squared, and I know the antiderivative of secant squared. So we have that tan squared, so the identity we used up here and the one I'm going to use again is this identity. So it's worth writing down. What's the identity? The identity is that we have tan squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta. That's just the sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 identity, but you divide everything by cosine squared. So we've got a tan squared. I can rewrite that as secant squared theta minus 1 d theta. The antiderivative of secant squared is tan theta. The antiderivative of 1 is theta. So we've done our antiderivative now. We've got the antiderivative expressed in terms of our variable theta. Now we need to rewrite it back in terms of x. So we go back up to the relationship between x and theta. And this is where the right triangle comes in handy. Because I want to know what tan of theta is, and I want to know what theta is. What's tan theta? Tan theta is opposite over adjacent, so tan theta is going to be the square root of x squared minus 1. What is theta? Well, I've got some choices here for how to write theta. I could write it as, well, tan theta, maybe it's worth writing here, tan theta is the square root of x squared minus 1. So what's theta? Theta is arctan of square root of x squared minus 1. So I can write that as arctan of square root of x squared minus 1 plus c. And so there is our result. Everything back in terms of x. And let's have a look at the last example now. It's this rational function x squared minus 3x minus 4. So it is the integral from 0 to 3 of 1 over x squared minus 3x minus 4. Now we can apply partial fraction decomposition here if we can factor the denominator into linear factors. So does the denominator factor? Are we able to split it up? Well, it's going to be, let's see, negative 4 and a plus 1, that looks like it'll do it. x squared, x minus 4, that's minus 3x, and then the negative 4 times a 1 is negative 4, so that'll do it. And now we can do the partial fraction decomposition on that integrand. So that means take our integrand, x minus 4, x plus 1, and split it up into something over x minus 4 plus something over x plus 1. And I want these numbers a and b so that when I add them up I get that, new, that exponent of a 1 on top. So maybe at this stage we'll just clear denominators. 1 is equal to a times x plus 1 plus b times x minus 4. Now I can expand, compare coefficients, or I could do another technique, which is if this is to be true for all x values, then I could say, well, why don't we take x equals negative 1 and plug it into the expression. If I plug x equals negative 1 in, I get 1 is equal to 0 minus 5b, or in other words, b is equal to negative 1 fifth. Similarly, I can take x to be 4. If I take x to be 4, then I get 1 is equal to 5a plus 0, and a is 1 fifth. 
So I've got my values for a and b. So our integral can be rewritten as the integral from 0 to 3 of 1 fifth over x minus 4 plus negative 1 fifth over x plus 1 dx. Now I can work out the antiderivatives of each piece. There's this 1 fifth that I can pull all the way out front. There's an ln of x minus 4 and a minus ln of x plus 1. And that's going from 0 to 3. So this is going to be 1 fifth of ln of 3 minus 4, that's absolute value, so that's ln of 1 minus ln of 4 minus ln of, plugging 0 in, that's ln of 4, plus ln of, plugging 0 in, that's ln of 1. So ln of 1 is 0. ln of 4 minus ln of 4, that's 2 ln 4. But ln of 4 can also be rewritten as ln of 2 squared. The 2 can come down, so we can write this as a 4 fifths ln of 2, just using properties of logarithms. And so there's our result. Except for the fact that I just made a mistake here in that I dropped a sign accidentally. That should be a negative sign there and then a negative sign out front. So the answer should be negative 4 fifths ln of 2.